<laughs> Great. So, uh, well, I'd like to join June in thanking Conquen and all the other organizers for putting this together. I think I've been at all of the ITAMP cold <coughs> molecule workshops. Hard to believe the first one was 20 years ago. Uh, seems like yesterday. But uh, at any rate, um, as Conquen said, uh, I'm going to really focus my talk today on on uh, things about precision measurements and in particular uh, electric dipole moments with cold molecules, searches for electric dipole moments. Uh, in the spirit of the workshop, m most of what you're going to hear here is actually uh, work in progress. So uh, bear with me because there will be loose ends and open questions. So uh, I think almost everyone in this room has heard this story before, so I'm going to go quickly through the introductory material. Uh, again, the focus of the talk is looking for, looking to see if particles such as an electron or a proton or a nucleus has an asymmetric charge distribution, an electric dipole moment along its spin axis. If this is true, then this indicates that time reversal is not a good symmetry of nature. So an EDM along a spin uh, violates time reversal. This is interesting in exotic physics. It turns out that it's needed new physics in order to explain the, the matter-antimatter asymmetry that's observed uh, cosmologically. So this is well-motivated search for new physics. Uh, the new physics typically comes from uh, new particles, new very massive particles, much like virtual exchange of particles can induce an anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. Virtual exchange of particles, even unknown particles, can induce an electric dipole moment of the electron. This requires some time reversal violation in the underlying new physics. But with a very simple sort of hand-waving dimensional argument, you can convince yourself that at the current sensitivity to the EDM, that I'll tell you a bit about, uh, we're already probing new particles with mass of several TV, many TV, which is above the range that's, that's directly probed at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so we're really, these EDM experiments are really pushing into a new frontier in particle physics that's inaccessible in, in almost any other way. So uh, how do these electric dipole moments show up in atoms or molecules? Well, th there's a few bits to the, to the argument here. So the beginning bit is that there's really a fundamental issue, which says that if you have a neutral atom or molecule, uh, you apply an electric field to it. You wish that you can apply an electric field to your electron or proton so that it feels a torque if it has an electric dipole moment. But very simple logic says you can't. Because if you applied an electric field to an electron or a proton, it should accelerate and fly away. But we know our atoms and molecules don't fly away when you apply an electric field to them. Uh, and it turns out it's, it's a one-line proof called Schiff's theorem, which says that uh, the, effectively the charges in an atom or neutral atom or molecule get screened by the other charges so that the average electric field felt by any individual particle is exactly zero, which it has to be because otherwise it would accelerate away. But, as Schiff already knew, uh, there are several loopholes in this theorem. They only apply to point-like and non-relativistic particles. Uh, and that means that real particles in real atoms and molecules uh, are subject to these loopholes. In particular, electrons can move relativistically in near the nucleus, a uh, highly charged nucleus in a heavy atom, which means the electron electric dipole moment is observable. Nuclei have a finite size, uh, and that means that something which is roughly equivalent to an EDM, a thing called a shift moment, is observable of nuclei. And for the purposes of this talk, you can just think of this shift moment as essentially being a quantity that's proportional to the EDM of whatever unpaired nucleon is in the nucleus, a neutron or a proton. So what I'll tell you about today are a couple of experiments uh, one we call ACME, looking for the electron's electric dipole moment in thorium oxide molecules. And a new one that we call Centrex, looking for the uh, nuclear shift moment, which I'll refer to as a nuclear air quote EDM uh, for simplicity, in thallium fluoride molecules. Uh, the basic story here is that if you put, if you embed your, your particles, an electron or a proton inside a nucleus, in a fully polarized molecule, as shown in the cartoons here, these uh, electric dipole moments lead to energy shifts, just d dot e interaction. Uh, and that energy shift can be thought of as equivalent to an effective intramolecular electric field that's acting on the EDM. Uh, it turns out this relativistic motion of the electron can, is a gigantic loophole. It's so big that inside thorium oxide molecules, 
the electron EDM is effectively acted on by an effective field of 80 gigavolts per centimeter, a really gigantic field. Uh, the, by contrast, the nucleons don't move relativistically at all. The nucleus has a finite size, but it's not very big. And in the end, in a fully polarized molecule like this, the proton, uh, unpaired proton in a thallium nucleus, feels an effective field which is about 30 kilovolts per centimeter, which turns out to be about the same field you need to fully polarize a thallium fluoride molecule. So for, for nucleon EDMs, you can think of the, the loophole in Schiff's theorem as not an enhancement, but rather a reduction of the suppression that you would otherwise have from screening. Uh, if the nucleus were a point particle, this would be zero. So uh, bottom line, not surprisingly, this means it's harder to look for these nuclear moments than it is for the electron in a certain sense. Okay, uh, again, most of you have seen this picture, but the basic idea to look for an EDM is to apply parallel electric and magnetic fields. Uh, that causes uh, an additional uh, shift on the usual Zeeman splitting that's proportional to the particle electric dipole moment. And you flip the electric field back and forth relative to the magnetic field and look for a correlated shift in the splitting between spin up and spin down. It's very easy to write a figure of merit for statistical sensitivity. It's just the energy shift divided by the energy resolution. Uh, and that's proportional to the electric field, the effective field applied to the particle, the coherence time of the measurement. And uh, if your shot noise limited, uh, the square root of the total number of detected particles. So uh, what, what we seek to do is maximize these. Uh, and molecules get electric fields that are effective fields that are in typically three to four orders of magnitude bigger than were possible in atoms, simply because it's possible to completely polarize a molecule, while, whereas it's uh, generally hard to achieve more than a polarization of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 on an atom uh, for the biggest fields you can apply. Of course, with molecules, we have to worry about being cold, in, or, or we'd like to be cold to have high resolution measurements. Uh, the first issue is just the Boltzmann distribution over internal state. So you'd like internal cooling to have large signal sizes. You'd like to cool the, the center mass motion so that you can, for example, reduce Doppler width and have longer observation times for narrower lines. And the ultimate version of this is to trap molecules so that you can really get the longest possible observation times and the best <coughs> energy resolution, at least in principle. Of course, there are no guarantees that trapping actually gets you good energy resolution. Uh, but at least it gives you the possibility to have it uh, with a very long observation time. So uh, just a quick review. Again, I think most of you have heard this story, but I'll tell you a bit about our ACME search for the electron electric dipole moment using thorium oxide molecules. Thorium oxide was chosen uh, about a decade ago for some nice features. It has this enormous effective internal field of 80 gigavolts per centimeter, which is close to the largest that's known. Uh, uh, the ground state of thorium oxide is actually a singlet, so it has no unpaired electrons and no unpaired EDMs. But we instead do the, do the measurement in this first uh, excited state, a metastable state, which is a triplet state with two unpaired electrons, one of which feels this large electric field. Uh, we made some early measurements of this lifetime, saying that it, the lifetime of this state, saying it was more than about two milliseconds. Uh, and there are various other nice features that I won't dwell on uh, for this talk. Uh, in order to do the experiment, we have to populate this state. We now do this with a coherent STIRAP process that's quite efficient, about 80% efficient. And then we can detect uh, the, the spin, uh, sp energy splitting between spin up and spin down in this state by probing and, and uh, detecting fluorescent light. Here's a schematic of the second generation of ACME that was just completed last year. Starts with a cryogenic molecular beam source uh, that gives us a rotational temperature of about 4 Kelvin. Next in is a, a stage of rotational cooling where lasers uh, are used to optically pump uh, the first few rotational levels into, into the lowest level, gaining us about a 2.5 fold increase in population. Molecules then are prepared in the metastable triplet state with this steer up that I mentioned. They then fly through about a 20 centimeter long region, which is about corresponds to a flight time of a millisecond. And then they're read out uh, uh, via laser induced fluorescence with about a 5% overall efficiency. 
So I'm going to make, uh, well, and let me just point out this was ACME 2, uh, I'll show you the result in the next slide, was done by a really fantastic team of students and postdocs, uh, led by the three old folks over here, uh, me and John Doyle and Jerry Gabriels. Um, and I'll just point out that most of this team have now moved on to other positions, and if you're interested in working on ACME, please talk to us, because as you'll hear, the future is pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to skip right to the end here so of ACME 2 so that I can get on to newer things, but a couple of takeaway messages here. One is that uh, the statistics for ACME 3 were not perfect. There was excess noise in the wings of our distribution, shown in two ways here, with a chi-squared of about 3, which meant we were about a factor of root 3 above the shot noise limit of sensitivity. Nevertheless, uh, we were able to produce a result uh, that was about nine times better than the best limit from before, uh, limited roughly equally by statistics and, and st statistical error in systematics, and gave a new limit uh, of less than 1 times 10 to the minus 29 e centimeters for the electron EDM. This puts this in some historical and, and physics context. The, the ACME 2018 result, again, is about an order of magnitude beyond the best limits from before. Uh, that was from our ACME experiment with a very similar result from Jilla to our first ACME result. And uh, we're, we're really cutting deep into the parameter space of predictions of particle theories uh, for new physics beyond uh, the electroweak scale. Though I think it's fair to say that uh, as we continue to rule things out, theorists are clever. They invent new theories that's, that slide uh, along with our result. But the, the real fact here is that with the fact that EDM experiments like ours are not seeing anything, the LHC is not seeing any new particles, it's really not clear what energy scale new particles can appear at. And EDMs are one of the only ways that can push to much higher energy scales within the next 5, 10 years. Put this in just a little bit more context, this is a plot from a particle theorist, Jonathan Feng, uh, who provides the lovely quote, all the constraints shown here are merely indicative and subject to significant loopholes and caveats. In other words, no one really knows what the new theory of new physics beyond the standard model is. A popular version has been supersymmetry, so this plot shows uh, on a log scale the mass of possible supersymmetric partners, every, every standard model partner particle has a supersymmetric partner listed here. Here's the mass of the heaviest known standard model particles, top quark and Higgs boson. The light blue lines show what's been ruled out by the LHC for these various types of supersymmetric particles. The green lines show what this particular theorist uh, had been saying for decades was a, a reasonable upper bound where supersymmetric extensions to the standard model would make sense, would be natural. The purple shows what's been ruled out now. Purple and blue shows what's been ruled out now by EDMs. The purple is mostly from our ACME experiment. You see that in many cases it pushes well above the level that was considered to be natural by this guy and many other particle theorists. And I'll just point out that part of this plot is not from ACME, but instead it's from an, a nuclear EDM experiment, the Mercury 199 experiment at Seattle, which really gives complementary information. It tells you uh, not only about a subset of supersymmetric particles, but about possible new physics coupling to, to hadrons rather than leptons. Uh, so th these are really quite complementary in terms of their sensitivity to new physics. Um, so as I mentioned, ACME has a bright future. Here's the picture that I showed before. And uh, something interesting that we just learned is that this statement that the that the lifetime of this date was at least about two milliseconds is true but insufficient. So uh, we just recently did some new measurements of the lifetime of this metastable state. Uh, now instead of in a dirty ablation cell in a nice clean beam, and what we found is the lifetime is not about two milliseconds but rather about five milliseconds, uh, which is actually a pretty big change. Um, in addition, uh, we've, we've learned how to take advantage of a new resource in the thorium oxide molecule, which is a second metastable state. It's the fine structure partner to the H state where we do the EDM experiment. It's the Q triplet delta two state. And to make a long story short, we've found uh, through measurements done by our postdoc, Xing Wu, 
that this state has an extremely long lifetime, essentially infinite from our point of view. It's easy to populate and depopulate by driving with convenient lasers. Uh, we've demonstrated efficient steer wrap in and out of this state. Uh, this state has a big magnetic moment, a big electric dipole moment. It has omega doublet structure, so it has linear Stark shifts up to very high fields. That means that we can use this as a way to make a very strong either electric or magnetic lens for molecules, uh, and we can also use it as an in situ magnetometer, very sensitive since it has a big magnetic moment. So with that in mind, uh, we're now starting up the third generation of ACME. It looks a lot like the, like the second generation, but with a few key differences. We're going to extend this interaction length, so it's five times longer than it was before. We're going to use an electrostatic or possibly magnetostatic lens to focus the molecules by putting them into the Q state and then taking them back out. Uh, that gives us about a factor of 20 more signal. Uh, we're going to replace our phototubes with more modern silicon photomultipliers for higher efficiency. Uh, and we've, we've reduced or actually eliminated this, this technical noise problem that caused the, the chi-squared to be three rather than one in our old measurement. Altogether, as we're anticipating about a factor of 20 improved sensitivity, and we're already getting started, uh, waiting for the new funding to come in, hopefully, uh, and, and looking for folks to come and, and join the fun. So, um, as I mentioned, there, there are really these two uh, complementary classes of EDM experiments, looking for the electron EDM, our ACME experiment, and the JILA experiment using trapped ions. Uh, and then for nuclear EDMs, by far the best is the, the Mercury 199 atomic EDM experiment at the University of Washington. Uh, all of these are long-running experiments going on for a decade or longer, all have upgrades ongoing, uh, but it's kind of amazing when you look at these experiments. Not, none of them uses laser cooling. The Jill experiment is the only one that uses trapping for EDM experiments. Uh, so this, this is really in stark contrast to the rest of, the, of atomic physics. Uh, in many ways, these are old-fashioned experiments. And the last four electron EDM experiments have used molecules because of this much greater effective field associated with the polarizability. So uh, what we would like to do is extend that molecular advantage to look for nuclear EDMs, or the nuclear shift moment, which is the EDM in air quotes. Uh, we're going to do this using thallium fluoride molecules. This is a closed shell molecule, a singlet sigma, sigma molecule. We'll be looking for the EDM of the thallium nucleus. Uh, uh, the fluorine, which has a spin a half, fluorine also has a spin a half. The nuclear spin precession rate in this molecule, due to the larger polarization, is about four orders of magnitude larger than it is in mercury atoms. Um, just point out, this is not, in some ways, not a new idea. In fact, for many decades, Experiments using thallium fluoride set the best limits on these nuclear EDMs. Experiments done by Norman Ramsey, Pat Sanders, Ed Hines, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot known about this molecule. We can use the fluorine as a way, as a co-magnetometer to suppress systematic effects. And, and the basic idea is to use molecular enhancement, but also some new features uh, that we've learned how to take advantage of in molecules like cycling detection and cooling to start probing hadronic T violation at the TeV scale. Um, just a little bit about thallium fluoride. Uh, June told us about laser cooling of yttrium oxide. We'll hear a few other laser cooling experiments uh, during the workshop. Thallium fluoride looks remarkably good for laser cooling. There's an excited state with a 100 nanosecond lifetime. The frank Conant factors are very diagonal. It's 99% to, to decay back to V equals zero. Um, so even with one laser, we can cycle enough photons to, to detect very efficiently. Um, maybe one repump laser is enough to do transverse cooling. These lasers annoyingly are ultraviolet, uh, but uh, that's becoming more and more standard. Uh, so we've, we've started to really work with thallium fluoride now. Um, and I want to just spend a few minutes talking about optical cycling in this molecule, because it's quite different from all the other molecules where optical cycling has been used to date. So again, the electronic structure, the ground state is a singlet sigma. The excited state is a triplet pi one state uh, with a lifetime of 100 nanoseconds. Um, the, this excited state has huge hyperfine structure because it's got 
unpaired electron spins and thallium is heavy, splittings of uh, either many gigahertz or a good fraction of a gigahertz in the excited states. So all these states are, are very, very well resolved. By contrast, the ground state is a singlet state with only two spin a half nuclei. So the hyperfine structure here is extremely small, order tens of kilohertz. Um, and that means that all of these states are completely unresolved with respect to our optical transition, which has a weight width of one and a half megahertz. In addition, these states are completely non-magnetic. All they have is nuclear spins. Uh, so we can't do the sort of tricks that have been common in other laser cooling experiments to use magnetic fields to remix Zeeman dark states. It simply doesn't work. If we try to apply a big enough magnetic field, the upper state shifts away by, by an enormous amount. Um, what we can do, and we've done, many of us have done with, with uh, molecules for laser cooling, is switch the polarizations back and forth. That eliminates uh, some of the dark states that appear in this huge manifold of, of unresolved levels, but it doesn't eliminate them all. There are still hyperfine states, superposition of hyperfine states, which are dark to either polarization, and they evolve extremely slowly because of this small hyperfine splitting. So it's a sort of curious question, how fast can you cycle photons in a system like this, and what do you have to do to, to do it? Um, so to try to get some insight in this, this is a pretty complicated system, which we can solve the optical block equations for, but it's a mess because there are a huge number of parameters. So to try to get some insight, we, we started thinking about simple toy models. What if you have, for example, uh, a system of two unresolved ground states with some small splitting delta between them, uh, both coupled to some common excited level. And, of course, it's well known that you can change a basis to get a bright and a dark state, a bright state which, can, which uh, you can drive to the excited state, a dark state that you can't, and then a coupling between these states, which is just given a magnitude by the hyperfine splitting of the energy eigenstates. Uh, so here are these two alternate pictures. This one turns out to be a little easier to think about conceptually. Um, and what we would like to see is, is it possible to gain the theoretical maximum scattering rate, which is the excited state uh, decay rate times the ratio of the number of excited states, here one, to the ratio of total states, which is here three. Is that possible? And it turns out the answer to that question is, is sort of uh, well known, but uh, we had to remind ourselves of it. So. If there's a very small splitting, for example, a tenth of the excited state line width, uh, shown here by the coupling between the bright and the dark states, then uh, no matter how much laser power you apply, you can only get about 5% of gamma scattering rate, so six times smaller than the theoretical maximum that you would imagine. And this is true. Uh, in general, the, the best possible scattering rate occurs uh, when uh, or yeah, the, the scattering rate is limited just by the, the coupling between these states, which is to say by the magnitude of the hyperfine splitting, which is very small, unfortunately. Um, in addition, what we found is if in this simple toy model system, if you say, uh, think about inhomogeneities in the system, for example, the effect of a Doppler width, uh, this, this plot shows scattering rate as a function of of Rabi frequency for different detunings of the laser. And this is a really striking behavior. In every case, no matter how the laser is detuned, there's an optimum value of, gamma, of, of the Rabi frequency omega, which is quite different from what we're used to in a two-level system, whereas you just crank up the power, you saturate, and uh, your scattering goes up and up, and then finally saturates to a constant level. Here, for any given detuning, there's an optimum Rabi frequency, and if you exceed that, your scattering rate actually goes down. That's easy to understand. What happens is, as you apply too big a Rabi frequency, you AC Stark shift the bright state away by roughly omega, and then it has trouble coupling via, via delta to the dark state. So you get stuck by decaying into a dark state, and you can't get out because the bright state is too far away when there's a big omega. And this gets even worse if your laser is detuned. The maximum scattering rate requires higher power. That's not surprising. That's familiar. But even at the best power, you can't get very much scattering, again, because it's hard to couple with this weak coupling delta to a state that's been pushed very far away. 
Um, so the upshot of this is it turns out that any because there's an optimal scattering rate, uh, if you have too much power, it's bad. If you have too little, it's bad. Means that any sort of inhomogeneity in the system really reduces the scattering rate dramatically. This can be from Doppler broadening, from the fact that you have a Gaussian laser beam profile, so some molecules see more power or less power. As they fly through, they see more power or less power. Almost never are things optimal for any molecule. Um, nevertheless, there's, there are hints of a way out. For example, if you have an auxiliary level, in our case, this would be a lower rotational level that we can couple to the hyperfine uh, split levels with microwaves. Uh, that we can increase the cycling rate up to about the maximum uh, as long as you drive this microwave hard enough uh, and you, you have laser coupling, which is si of similar strength to the microwave coupling. Uh, but this is just the toy, toy model. It's not too hard to convince yourself that if you have not just two states here, but n states, n minus one of them are dark, then you need n minus one auxiliary states to break the degeneracy of all these dark states and recover a high scattering rate. So uh, with that in mind, we've been working with Larry Hunter from Amherst College with, with his uh, excellent team, postdoc Nate Claiborne and several undergrads, uh, to study optical cycling and thallium fluoride. Here's the level structure. We have an isolated F equals one level coupled to unresolved hyperfine levels with F equals two, one, one, and zero. Microwaves to remix these levels, uh, switch polarization of the optical and microwave fields. Just notice that here there are three excited states out of 20 total, which means it's going to be hard to scatter quickly on this no matter what. If you don't have the microwaves, there are six slowly evolving dark states. With the microwaves, uh, if you count correctly, there should be no dark states remaining. Uh, Here's, this should be closed to about 100 photons before it decays to another vibrational level. There's another state which has a rotational branch, which is used for calibration of the strength of the signal on the cycling transition. Their apparatus looks like this. Uh, one view, end on, there's a molecular beam coming out of the page. Multi-pass prisms to make multi-passes of laser beams crossing the molecules, and a camera to make images of the molecular fluorescence. Here's the same view, uh, or view from the top instead of from the side. Uh, microwaves are applied at an angle here. And what this gives is images of the molecular fluorescence as a function of position, which you can then look to see uh, uh, the, the decay rate here gives you an effective scattering rate for the molecules in this system. Um, so based on our models, uh, uh, Larry and his group have done what we call, you know, all measures taken. Uh, we've got uh, sidebands uh, to cover the whole Doppler width, uh, this extreme multipass polarization switching of lasers and microwaves. Despite all these measures, in about 250 microseconds, we scatter only about 50 photons, with a scattering rate about a tenth of what we would have anticipated. Uh, that's enough for efficient detection and cooling, but uh, uh, it's still a bit of a mystery why we're having so much trouble getting to a reasonable scattering rate in this system. Nevertheless, we're pushing on with Centrex. Uh, Centrex, the first generation, is going to look a lot like Acme, and construction of this is, is underway, uh, with the goal to get uh, a better limit on the proton EDM by about a factor of 30. Um, we've assembled a nice team, students and postdocs here, uh, collaborating with Tanya Zelovinsky, Dave Kaywall from UMass, and Steve Lamro from Yale. Uh, and we built a lot of stuff, a beam source, system for rotational cooling, an electrostatic quadrupole lens, lots of UV lasers and, and stabilization mechanisms and so on. So this is a full-scale effort that's underway. Um, just want to say briefly that sort of ultimate vision for EDM experiments would be to, to hold molecules in a lattice, much like it is done now for optical atomic clocks. You get a sense of how powerful this would be if you had a million molecules with coherence time of 10 seconds, you could do reasonably about a thousand times better than, than our latest ACME 2 result, corresponding to, to reach of many hundred TeV in mass. Um, 
with even long-term potential for improvement via spin squeezing because of the density of molecules is high enough to employ standard spin squeezing protocols. Um, but uh, this has been known for a long time. People have been planning to do this with atoms rather than molecules for a couple of decades now. Papers from Steve Chu's group, Dave Weiss is still pursuing an experiment like this with cesium atoms. Even with a tiny effective field of an atom, about four orders of magnitude less than you get in thorium oxide, they were projecting sensitivity around the ACME2 limit. Um, so this is really, really promising, though it's critical that uh, the critical message from these papers is that to control systematics, you're going to need very low temperatures. Um, so we've been thinking a bit about which species uh, we, we might be able to use for this sort of experiment. You need something with a large Z to get a big field. You need something that's easy to polarize, has the right electronic structure, and can be made ultra cold. And we'll hear a bit later in the conference uh, from, from people that are working towards this. There are several experiments using direct laser cooling of either terbium or barium-based uh, molecules and even a proposal to use radium fluoride, uh, which has a field which is effective field almost as big as thorium oxide. Um, but been wondering for a while, why not use assembled molecules? As we heard from June, species like KRB are extremely, uh, and other assembled molecules, the technology is very advanced now. Uh, so this idea thought of more than a decade ago, uh, John Bone, unfortunately, he's not here for me to apologize to. I sent him on a wild goose chase to calculate the effective field in molecules like a terbium rubidium or a terbium cesium, and the answer was they're tiny, about 100 times smaller than in thorium oxide. The electronic structure is not right in these molecules. Uh, so the question is why, and, and the, it seems that what you would like to have, the molecules that are known to have big effective fields, have strong ionic bonds. Unfortunately, the standard laser coolable atoms, it's, it's hard to get them to make ionic bonds. Uh, but it turns out there's one exception, which is the silver atom, which has an electron affinity of 1.3 eV. That's almost the same as the electron affinity of oxygen. It's also been laser cooled and trapped. Uh, it has a... a, a Alkali-like structure, the only thing that's really different is it has a UV transition wavelength. So been working with Timo Fleig from Toulouse to, to think about a sort of ultimate test case, which is silver radium molecules. Radium is the heaviest uh, laser-cooled atom to date. It's an alkaline earth. Um, we expected for silver radium to have the right kind of electronic structure uh, and also to be easy to polarize. And it turns out that is true. It has an effective field of about 65 gigavolts per centimeter and uh, a big electric dipole moment, small rotational constant, and it only takes about 250 volts per centimeter to fully polarize it, uh, which sounds eminently doable. So I know I'm out of time here, so I'll just skip and say we think that there's a plausible pathway to, to do something like has been done both with bialkalis and now with uh, bialkaline earths. Um, by doing, making preformed pairs in a lattice, uh, uh, doing some sort of process to associate them and then steer apping them to the ground state. Of course, there are many questions, many unknowns here, many paths to failure, but it seems plausible that, that all this could work. Uh, Timo Flag has done an enormous amount of work to, to find all the potential curves and transition dipole moments and C6 coefficients, Frank Kahneman factors, and so on. The bottom line, we're hammering out the last few details here, but it seems that the necessary ingredients, aside from knowledge about collisional properties of the atoms, exists to, to be able to, to assemble molecules like silver radium. So I'll just stop there, say that uh, this is a sort of extreme test case. There are other analogous possibilities like silver mercury or silver ytterbium, which may also work with, with little difference. Some similar ideas have been explored by Banu Das's group in the last year or so. Um, but maybe the takeaway message here is that silver seems to be a sort of magic electronegative partner for assembled molecules for EDMs. Uh, this opens a lot of doors, even including possible application to nuclear shift moments. So uh, with that, I'll end and just, just 
the takeaway message is really that EDMs are in many ways the new vanguard of high energy physics. They're, they're again, one of the very, very few ways to push to look for new physics at higher energy scales. And luckily, the cost is you know, about three orders of magnitude less than, than the next glider. So we can do a few of them. So sorry for going over. Thanks for your attention. So we, uh, Larry's just acquired a second UV laser, so he's going to be probing where the population ends up now. Uh, I would say the the loss rate is not is not terribly inconsistent with the loss that we expect, uh, given the scattering rate we see. It looks reasonably consistent with just decaying to the excited vibrational level. So it, it's not it's not leakage; it's just slow scattering that it, that we're fighting against. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, there, unfortunately, there really is dark, are dark states that are robust against all three polarizations. And I try to get back this picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. So you can do it. You can think about it from a simple state counting argument. So down here we have five plus three plus three plus one, twelve, twelve sublevels. Any given polarization can only couple one superposition state to one excited state. There are three excited states. So with any three polarizations, three linearly independent polarizations, you can couple to nine superpositions of these states. And that leaves three behind that are dark. Now they're not they they're not stationary dark states. They do evolve at the at the frequency of the hyperfine splittings because there'll be in general some linear combination of different hyperfine states. But that evolution is slow, and those those three states by themselves don't couple to any laser polarization. Just yeah, annoying. Yes. So you have that law from a certain diffraction of G, right? Yes. Now if you switch to a super, like a 90 millisecond lifetime state, the diffraction difference, uh, the region can be longer, right? How much longer? Like a 20 times longer? Right? Yeah, so uh, it's important to recognize in a beam which has some divergence, uh, at a certain point, you stop winning from making it longer. Let's say you have an infinite lifetime, as we do in thallium fluoride, for example. It's a ground state. As you make the beam longer and longer, you get more interaction time. But due to the divergence, you can catch in a finite volume a smaller and smaller number. Those exactly cancel each other out once this interaction length is long compared to the distance it takes you before you start interacting. So as long as this is long compared to this pre-interaction distance, it doesn't win you anything any longer. Okay, um, that's break. Uh, that's actually first. Thanks, David. For <laughs>